Today we have chapter eight, the death of class debate. I have all the slides done. I have completed all the slides for all of the remaining five chapters ahead wow. of time. Well, absolutely incredible. Well, yeah, it, that's some it killed real me. Remarkable stuff. It took like a week. Yeah. Wow. Especially the chapter 12, which has got an incredible something like 59 slides, which we will never finish. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's get into this death of class debate. Shall I take the introduction? Okay. In the mid to late 1990s and early 2000s, there was a short but lively discussion that came to be known as the death of class debate. In the context of capitalist triumphalism at the end of the Cold War and the marginalization of Marxism as an explicit framework for social criticism, the argument that class no longer had any explanatory power had particular bite. The two most forceful proponents of the death of class thesis, Jan Pakulski and Malcolm Waters, presented their ideas in synoptic form in their essay, The Reshaping and Dissolution of Social Class in Advanced Society. Who here uh, knows who these Jan Pakulski and Malcolm Waters people are? And is anybody here, have they been, are they familiar with this actual debate before reading this? I've heard reference to this debate, but I don't know much about it. As far as like Jan, Paul Poopy and Malcolm, whatever. No, I don't know who they are. Jeez. And that's, that's a Polish name. Come on. You know, Poland... You know, you, I guess, can we be racist against Poland? Not if you're in the UK. That's There's awesome. too many Europeans on this show now. I can't just be racist to Eastern Europeans and feel okay about it because it, it means something different if you live in Europe. <sighs> Those are simpler times. I No, I, I didn't really. I haven't engaged with, like, the sociological literature. I'm only familiar with, like, Euro-communist stuff and, like, the, the communizer response to the Euro-communists who were declaring the death of class and going after gender, race, you know, other kinds of uh, social divisions, um, which did inspire a lot of very interesting Marxism. And uh, there's also the sort of Italian autonomist way of dealing with this, I think is a little better. We'll get into it. I was sort of familiar with this stuff from like reading like Manuel Castells and some other kind of like more famous sociologists, but not like, I, I definitely wasn't deep into the sociological literature about this. Maybe we should get a sociologist. <laughs> no, I, I'm uh, only familiar, I'm mostly familiar I mean, we, with we, we, we had We had Bob on here, who's not oh, yeah. exactly a sociologist, but has taught. Oh, he's close enough. Uh, yeah, has taught sociology. Uh, Giddens, I, I think, is another person who's, mm -hmm. like, really associated with sort of death of class yes. arguments. Yes, I'm familiar with Giddens and that whole period of sort of neoliberal triumphalism and the sort of marginalization of the entire, like, Marxist research paradigm and program. Like, so mm -hmm. uh, that much I'm familiar with, but not the specific literature, not the specific sociology. Yeah, like, my only kind of interaction with it is a member of, like, a, a kind of a lib friend of mine. He was, there's some like famous UK kind of center right kind of philosopher. And he set up some like school, like, you know. Something. Oh, I remember that. Do you remember him? Yeah, What's his yeah, name? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. AJ something or CL something, some kind of name like that. And he was making this argument that my mate had picked up was saying like, you know, the working class doesn't exist. You know, it's, it only exists wow. as like, thing that, oh, it was a historical class that was in the 1850s and it doesn't exist anymore you know and that's like i'm sure this is bleeding out of these goddamn debates they're all part of this thing and that was kind absolutely. of absolutely is it aj i'm not, I think i'm thinking of rowling but it's like something you know like uh, <laughs> i don't remember i just i just remember like back in the day reading like his columns in the new york times that was like this guy is setting up a, a school for lib shit right uh yeah yeah I can't remember his name. I will find it. Okay, let's keep going here. They defend a particularly stark conclusion that contemporary class analysts manufacture class where it no longer exists as a meaningful social entity. Rather than dismiss out of hand their claims, Marxist and Weberian class analysts need to take seriously the arguments that we are moving rapidly towards a classless society, or at least a society within which class has dissolved as a salient explanatory category. 
Wright believes a dialogue with their arguments can be productive for clarifying the nature of class analysis, the status of its explanatory claims, and the tasks it faces. Like, it seems kind of wild that like that, that this stuff can be really taken seriously in any real sense. Like, what does it say about like, or you know, establishment sociology that they can say things like class no longer exists as a meaningful social entity? That that has a substantial, you know, ideological superstructural portion to it. I suppose, you know, on one level, I don't think it is in our intuitions to, to be like, oh yeah, yeah, capitalism's evolving into a classless society. That sounds sane. That sounds insane to me. Uh, on the other hand, I do think that it can be good for us to take it seriously just as a foil because it's the most extreme form of this ideology that we, you know, that we live in. Capitalism is essentially a classless society. <laughs> that, yeah, uh, and Noam, I mean, Noam Chomsky it's... talks about. It's worth noting that like, like Hart and Negri's autonomism was basically this thesis, but just from like a sort of lefty revolutionary perspective that like mm -hmm. the multitude was already the classless society in actuality. It just had to realize its existence. Yeah. I so mean, like I even, even on the left, like this shit was like very common. There were there were so many academics in that time who were like, yeah, yeah, I'm an autonomist. I like read hard and angry, and that means I don't believe in class. Right. Oh, yes. Pathetic, a lot of it. Sophia, did you have something to say? I mean, uh, I don't know. Pointing out how obviously silly that is doesn't feel like a good use of my time, honestly. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Well, I mean, okay, like, yes, like, it's like saying the proletariat is already the class of society, except there's this class over it that exists. I mean, come on. Right. Sophia, take this next, take the next section then for us. Sure. Introduction. There is a tendency in debates over theoretical ideas connected to ideological commitments for the rhetoric to become more extreme and polarized than perhaps the authors actually believe. Statements of the form, social class is in the process of dissolving, tend to drift into statements like, social class has dissolved. This kind of slippage occurs frequently in the Pikulski and Water, Waters papers. For example, they argue that the downward shift in the distribution of property blurs traditional class divisions, which suggests that the division is still present, but less sharply drawn. Well, immediately after they state that the downward distribution of property makes impossible the establishment of any boundary between classes on the basis of property, which suggests not simply that the class division is blurred, but that it has disappeared entirely. In Wright's judgment, the heart of their argument is not in these most extreme formulations, but resides instead in the weaker claim that class is no longer a powerful or salient explanatory category. Bukowski and Waters define four propositions that define the core commitments of class analysis. Wright tries to show that their characterization amounts to insisting that class analysis requires a generalized belief in class primacy, whereas Wright argues that class primacy is not an essential component of class analysis. Okay. So, like, who of us here kind of, like, disagrees with Wright that class doesn't have to be the prime essential driver of stuff? I mean, like, it doesn't have to be, but I right. I think it is. I think even issues of other identities, taking the, you know, kind of intersectional framework, right? Like, whatever intersections there are, they come down to impacting red and butter issues in a way that makes that the most salient in people's lived experiences. If you're gay and black and you can't get a job and you're homeless, that is fundamentally a class issue. That is the most salient issue you have in your lived experience. I can agree with that to like the extent or sorry, I, I agree with this idea that class isn't always primary. 
like in the same sort of way that Marx talks about like feudalism, where he's like, you know, well, this the the these class divisions, these divisions that based on the productive arrangements of society can be largely obfuscated by the social arrangements that exist at, at, at any given time, right? Like, you know, where he's talking about how, like, you don't really see the class nature of history until capitalism, because you have all this stuff about religion going on. You have all of these social divisions, uh, uh, sort of uh, like, you know, sumptuary laws, all this kind of stuff about status that is significantly altering the distribution of the surplus. And so, yeah, I agree with it to that extent. But I do kind of think that, like, yeah, after you get civilization, class is probably the primary factor in creating the unequal social arrangements that we see over history. Yeah, I, I'd say in general that, like, we mentioned uh, intersectionality. I, I think that Eric Olin Wright kind of fits that mold rather well because he is very interested in the way that, you know, you have all of these different systems of oppression. And he's even very generous in extending, you know, extending like the research agenda of Marxism structurally towards different like oppressions. And I don't know, in the way that right-wingers talk about cultural Marxism as like, damn it, they've like, you know, put all these identities and they kept the Marxist structure. Right is sort of for this in a way that I love. <laughs> And like, we'll look at feminism and, you know, make the analogous argument in feminism that we shouldn't just be, you know, looking for, feminists should not just be looking for equality of the sexes, but in sort of abolition of gender, really. Like, you yeah, know, he will, go, I, he will go through that. And I think that's neat. Um, I think I, I, I think I agree with feminists that the, the creation of patriarchy predates the creation of class. And is, yeah. is it, it is a more, I don't know if I would say fundamental, but at least as important as class, because it, it does have a historical primacy over class. Well, this is where I think, so uh, just to be a little bit blunt about it, often intersectionality theorists, I don't know, sometimes they sort of see everything as a big network system, but more often I tend to see them kind of seeing different systems interacting and Wright is very much in that camp. He doesn't see gender and class oppression as really uh, so relevantly related. Like he has a whole section in his book, Interrogating Inequality, where he says that Marxism and feminism are two, you know, two distinct research agendas are not really related. And, you know, that comes out of, again, there's the sort of uh, Stalinist roots of intersectionality, but there's also, there's also that Euro-communist turn that, is sort of the vanguard of, you know, everything but class intersectionality liberalism. <laughs> Whereas my love for the autonomous comes not from Hart Negri, who, uh, I don't know <laughs> if that's autonomous and fucking shoot me. Um, yeah, I mean, from, it was just, yeah. that's what people were, that's what you're people were saying when they were calling themselves autonomists. Is, no, no, you're, I'm not you're, saying that is all of autonomism. No, you're 100% right. And that's, that's kind of garbage to me. But I like the autonomous feminists who are trying to deal with gender as a labor division very seriously. So I, I disagree with Wright's read on feminism and Marxism. I think they're intricately related. Uh, and part of that, the way, and for me, part of the way that expresses itself is that sexual freedom is sort of a consumer good, a bourgeois good, which is really obvious when it comes to transition, like people that have a lot of money who can transition uh, versus people who don't <laughs> have all those resources. So yeah. I'm, I'm more in the camp that says that, you know, gender in general is stems out of a labor division and is sort of a, it's proto-class. It's so intimately related and processes of racialization are, I think a little, a little less directly related, but are like so close, so close. For instance, anti-black slavery comes out of the, you know, Arabian empire it's imported into Portugal and, and Spain by invasion. The same invasion that brings Aristotle and math and shit to Spain. 
also brings anti-black slavery. And what, you know, who develops the ideology of racism? It's, it's slavers, right? Like people that are looking to steal people from one society to make them work in another. So I, I think being like, a, I, don't, I don't know how to put this. I guess I am arguing for a kind of so-called class first, quote unquote. It's just that I also think that race and gender are really intimately, have this huge class basis. And it's not like class comes first because very obviously gender comes first. Gender is an endogenous to any of these economic units. If your society is small enough, you don't have the big kind of social class, but you certainly have, you know, people who can have babies, people who can't, and a whole bunch of customs around that. Is it similar to that kind of thing that Kyle was saying that the primary thing of capitalism was kind of like, in a, was it a Weberian kind of an exclusion before you get the kind of continuous exploitation relationship that we oh, have a similar yeah. kind of a dance between feminism and class? Uh, I don't know about that, though, because the thing is that I think, you know, with that sort of like autonomous, autonomous feminism, we can kind of like get at the root of like what gender is about by understanding the productive categories it constructs over history mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. prehistory. So it's not uh, strictly about exclusion. It's also about creating ongoing productive relations between genders. Yeah. So I think I disagree with Wright's understanding of what class primacy is, sort of, because he, he wouldn't include gen like reproductive relations around gender to be a version, like an endo class. That's why I think of it, you know, you have like this internal, this like labor division internal to an economic unit. Like for instance, uh, Alan Carling is another analytical Marxist who, while Eric Olin Wright has a like multi-systems multi social reproduction theory, which that's, that's huge. Those two things don't normally go together. Alan Carling has this rational choice rational choice, like unity feminism, where eh, it's like, it's one of the more interesting, like Marxist debates on feminism and everything's upside down. Like the, the hardcore feminist position is some rational choice theory. And then like the, the social reproduction theory, which is usually used to uphold some kind of unitary class gender theory is arguing against class gender theory. It's like the analytical Marxist debate around feminism and Marxism, mostly had by men. Um, is super interesting. The way I think about it, put simply, is there's kind of like um, the the other the non class forms of oppression that happen are colored by the mode of production you live under. Like gender gender based oppression is the oldest and ex, it exists chronologically before class. There's no denying that. But the way gender based oppression or the way racism or other forms of oppression are expressed are colored by the mode of production that they happen under. Gender-based oppression is not the same in feudalism as it is under capitalism, but it, it happened. Yeah, definitely. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, I uh, I just hit my sleep button on my keyboard and I sent my desktop <laughs> computer fully to sleep for the last two minutes. <laughs> I was trying desperately to get back on. So uh, sorry if I've missed anything here. Oh, yeah, uh, we, we, we just blew everybody's minds. Oh, shit. So, like, for me, like, see, it's very hard to distinguish between, like, what is class and what isn't class. Like, what we're talking about. Say, there's a, there's a comment here from Victoria Magna in the chat. Even in cases where you have socially obfuscated caste systems, you still see that the basis of those caste formations is over-controlling who has access to and ownership of production resources. And, like, I think this is... You know, mm -hmm. this is kind of how I see a lot of the stuff that gets put down as not being class at the root is kind of still class. Like, you know, if, you, if people talk about like, you know, what say the, the troubles in Northern Ireland, say, for example, you know, they talk about how it was the Catholics versus the Protestants. But really, it was over to do with like class relations that, you know, the Catholics were exploited more, had worse jobs poor housing, didn't own the land, didn't have access to working in a, in a lot of the different, they were excluded. It was legal to exclude based on religion from loads of types of jobs. So like, you know, what on, on the front of it looks like it's Catholics versus Protestants behind it was all like material class issues, you know, 
there was never I never heard like you know an argument between like a loyalist and a Republican saying, you you know, you transubstantiation motherfuckers, and then like, fuck you, consubstantiation prick, right? Never happened, right? Mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but like, never you do never. get, you do get like, you get shit like theologians from both sides arguing with each other, and then this being connected to like, who gets more or less of the surplus, you know? Like, this is, it, 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 there's like kind of seemingly disconnected conflicts that happen that are about sort of like redistributing the surplus at a remove, like a one, one degree of removal from the actual extraction. That's, I think, what Marx was talking about in his dis description of feudalism like that, right? Is it's, it's, it's not that it isn't about the distribution of the surplus. It's just that at some level, it doesn't appear that way. And mm -hmm. the immediate stakes appear to be about something else, even though the actual consequence is about that. Like, uh, I, I do kind of agree with right though. And I think like, you know, a lot of the times like class is not the dynamic the driver of say what's going on in the society to an obvious extent sometimes it's other things that may have like sec you know maybe like second order effects of class or whatever or maybe say not but uh i feel like you know i i don't feel i, I disagree so much with what what right is saying but then when i think about like say for example you know, just like say value theory, right? Which is mm -hmm. really an extension of like class relations, right? And we talk about like, you know, how deindustrialization has happened and the movements of capital and, you know, the reproduction of capital across society. It's hard to take class out of, you know, out of that. And you would have to say that that is the real driving force. Yeah. Esri, you're oh, fine. yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to process this because, um, this whole conversation reminds me of the essay on structural anti-Semitism and, well, no, no, the essay on the Nazi uh, Holocaust, the Shoah, by uh, the Canadian Jewish Marxist uh, Moshe Postum, where he takes to task a kind of like dumbass Marxist reading of World War II and anti-Semitism, where it's just like, you know, the Nazis are just blaming the Jews because they want to make money or something. I, I forget, like, the, the really dumb argument um, <laughs> that he's attacking, which I have heard before. It's not like I've never heard it before. I've heard it from turbo tanks. I've heard it from, like, beyond the ultra bordigist like, types that I suspect have some fascists at their bookstore or something. So it's not like a complete straw man. But what he says in response is very interesting, that because the... Nazis were some kind of perverted sort of socialism. And um, because there was such deep anti-Semitism, even in the heroic days of the workers' movement in Germany, that many people in the Jews saw the incarnation of modernity and capitalism. And so trying to eliminate the Jews was this expression of, you know, uh, trying to burn the value form in some way. And that was like a better Marxist reading of the Shoah because he cites this really telling incident when things are getting very bleak for Nazi Germany and they use all of these essential resources to put more Jews into death camps and try to kill them, try to kill as many as possible before the Soviets and the Americans liberate them. You know, like it tells you something about the way that class actually can form the basis of things while not being the only fucking determinant. You know, there's also this perverted yeah. fascist movement that, yes, was it a response to capitalism? Sure. But, you know, it, it got like, there's the, the nation state structure and like, you know, just the historical contingencies at the time that, you know, and, and then, you know, the symbolic way that, you know, the class interests express themselves. National class interests don't have to express themselves in a real cosmopolitan communist way. They can be quite nasty, right? Like it's not, it's not A to B. Like, you know, it's not like, oh, cool. You know, I'm being oppressed and therefore like, uh, 
you know, solidarity for, for you forever. It's like so much more complicated than that. So there's a dumbass version of Marxism and class first Marxism, which I think a lot of people, I don't know, over the years might believe that I am into because I try to make these arguments about class having this, you know, big basis. But I think it, those are terrible. I think, I think those arguments are like more false than their like intersectional alternatives. So at least the intersectional alternatives understand to some degree why the Nazis would buy ideology so hard that they would try to burn all the Jews as, as many as possible instead of get, you know, getting resources where they need to be to, to like beat the people fighting them. <laughs> Right. Like, I think you probably know this better than me, as you, but I think I remember hearing is like when the when they were running out of like stuff to gas the Jews, the Germans would line the or was that beforehand they would line them all up so they could shoot a bullet through like 10 of their heads? It would go through uh, their heads, something like no, that. They, they did that. I think they did that stuff first, but it was first. having a but it made the Germans sad to shoot all the Jews. So they came right. up with really interest. So they pioneered, you know, slaughterhouse techniques and stuff run on IBM computers, which many contemporary slaughterhouses are. And yeah, they, they created the industrial death machines that revolt us more than, you know, normal atrocities. Right. I tell you, I went to Majdanek. I went to, has, has anybody been to one of the the camps before? Yep. No, I have went not. Went to Majdanek in uh near lublin in poland and that was fucking yeah that's pretty fucking tough yeah jesus christ mm -hmm. i'd have to have a lot of free time to do that like i'm sure i'll do yeah. it someday but like to devote an entire like oh it's uh, going on a weekend oh it's like that would feel real weird um it's fucking grim probably the grimmest thing i've ever seen okay i'm just coming up on my hash <laughs> I'm glad to have brought it, brought it, brought it out. Um, it's, this is my fault. I brought up post down. Post down never makes people happy. No, I, I like that uh, analysis. I think that's a good analysis. You know. Um, yeah, that that definitely tracks with what I've read about like fascism in Austria as well, and like the reaction to modernity. Either the sort of fascist, like we reject everything, uh, mentality. Yeah. And I don't know, one thing I was going to say, I was trying to look for it there, I couldn't find it, but like uh, when I was reading some of, some quotes of like Bernstein for the SPD and things he had said, I did a, a, a like I did a Bernstein episode with Rosa Luxemburg on the, uh, uh, her critique of him. And it was like some of the stuff Bernstein was stay, saying to the SPD in like their, meet, their general meetings, you know, whatever. They were so fucking racist, man. I mean, they are ridiculously racist. And it's like, you know, and that wasn't, that was probably the majority of the SPD, let's be honest. Well, you how know. else did Nazi Germany happen? Right, right. And so when people look back to the glory days of the SPD, man, there's a lot of fucking horrible shit that must have been said and done by the, you know, the, the leading lights of who we think are like the greatest socialists that ever lived. Yeah, well, I mean, that's why, like, I fucking love, I don't know, the Jewish Polish woman who <laughs> was part of it. Rosa, and yeah. very very few other are really kind of worth anything. I mean, Karl Liebknecht, I don't know what his views on race were, but he seemed pretty solid. Okay, Kyle, how do you fancy doing uh, the four propositions? First one. Ah, uh, yes, the four propositions. The yes. trivium and the quadrivium. We're getting biblical uh, here. We, here is our quadrivium for class. All right. So the central tenet of Pakulski and Waters' critique is class analysis rooted in the Marxist tradition. But many of their arguments also apply to any form of class analysis that defines class in terms of the ownership and control over economic assets. They build their case around four general propositions abstracted from the literature on class. So the first proposition, the proposition of economism. Point one. Class is fundamentally an economic phenomenon. Point two, it refers principally to differences in the ownership of property, especially productive property with an accumulation potential and to differential market capacity, especially labor market capacity. Three, moreover, 
Such economic phenomena as property or markets are held to be the fundamental structuring or organizing principles in societal organization. The first two statements are unproblematic. However, the use of the definite article the before fundamental implies that class is the fundamental structuring principle in society. No Weberian would sign up to this, and many contemporary Marxists would also shy away from such a categorical claim. What do we make of that last third point there, Kyle? Like, because he's talking about economic phenomena. We're not talking about how people self-identify of like thinking about how they operate, whether it's class-driven or driven by nationality mm. or race or sex or whatever. We're talking mm. about economic phenomena as property or markets are held to be the fundamental structuring or organizing principles in societal organization. Like, what type of Marxists think that that is too strong a statement? If you're, I think if you're Baudrillard, you probably would not agree with that. <laughs> well, the, 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 the central point here is, is the uh, definite article V, right? It's thinking about it as a fundamental structuring or organizing principle. You, I would even go so far as, like, the most, but to imply that it is the only fundamental, I think, is a flaw. Well, I mean, it doesn't again, say the only. It doesn't say the only, but it just says the fundamental structuring. Like, but it, uh, it does. Using singular. a definite, using mm -hmm. a definite article and a singular noun there does imply. Well, if he, yeah. he's not saying it's I mean, the come only. on, come on, Tom. This is an analytical Marxist we're talking about. You think that you think that his <laughs> reading of of English grammar is off? Ha! <laughs> well. You, you know, you, you should check the logical translation. No, I'm kidding. I wish. No, no but like, what? Am I being? Am I being a bit? I, I don't know. Like, am I being dumb here? But like, uh, sure. when we're talking about like the the fundamental structuring principle in society, like I'm, you know, the economic structuring principles. Is that not what a Marxist is essentially saying that it's what? you know the economy that is the fundamental driver? <sighs> I, I mean. I think I think I think he's being more of a sociologist here than a purely a Marxist and, and the way that the phrasing here and, you know, jokes aside about analytical grammar and all that bullshit, they're kind of right in that, like, you have to break this down and think of it like, you know, break it down into symbols and think about it logically in that sense. And thinking about it sociologically, right, and just taking the text as is, the fundamental structuring or organizing principle, not the the fundamental economic or ec economy is the fundamental or etc. But looking at the structures of society as a whole, not just economically, economic phenomena or property or markets structure society, right? I, as a Marxist, believe that it is the most important, but it is not the only one, right? And it's not that's not exactly in line with how Lukowski and Waters are defining it. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm making sense here. I, I think the thing is like, it's sort of like the base superstructure problem. And I would personally say like, yeah, there are superstructural elements or elements you might not consider to be economic in this fundamental base right? Literally the fundament is the base, right? That's what it means. But I would still agree with the general principle here that economic phenomena, property markets are the fundamental structuring or organizing principles in societal organization. It just doesn't mean like, oh, line goes up, therefore Biden wins the election, right? It is not that yeah. simple. You know, there's there's two kind of ways of dealing with the base superstructure problem. One of them is is the one that he references by G. A. Cohen in his essay, Restricted and Inclusive Historical Materialism, where Cohen restricts the what the superstructure is, essentially. And instead of seeing, you know, he uses the example how many candles on the menorah, you know, why are there nine candles on the menorah. Oh, well, it's because of capitalism, like for a, for a kind of very broad um, idea of how, of how, you know, the inclusive historical materialism might work. 
and he argues for, and he revises himself and he argues for this more restricted form. So restricting the superstructure is the first option. The second option, which I'm fond of, is to expand parts of the base. And a lot of post-structuralist influenced Marxists like myself find that excluding the Darwinian structure of interpersonal power relations and sexuality, excluding that stuff from the material base is fucking insane to me. Yeah, or so like that's my strategy like the, there. Excluding the relation to nature from <laughs> right. the economic phenomena as exactly. property or markets is like absolutely bonkers and like one of the worst sort of like the cardinal sins of of of, yeah. of economics. Right. Yeah, it, it, it buys into an ideological premise. So I'm in, I'm greatly in favor of really both strategies, but I think the second strategy is is underutilized by Marxists because, you know, they kind of don't understand it. I'm a firm proponent of both. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I mean, right excludes, right isn't doing number, isn't doing the second. So if you have the first one, then I think what he's calling class, you know, yeah, it's not the only fucking thing, right? right. Like if you're excluding, you know, psychosexual power relations and interpersonal like Darwinian shit, like then sure, it's not the only big thing happening. It's more like Sophia is saying, or it might be this dialectic between, you know, our natural being and our, you know, form of organization or something that forms the, the basis. But, he, but even the notion of like trying to ex, you know, like trying to extract what we're, we're talking about there, you know, the, you know, say, for example, the stuff that Arnold talks about and fight like an animal, right? Uh, aggression tendencies and stuff like that and taking them out of class relations is like, I suppose sometimes when I think of class relations, I, 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 I just include a lot of those kind of dynamics mm -hmm. into it, you know, that, yeah, that help I, form these class structures. But I, I can I can see I can see Wright's point if we're talking about it like the way you are talking about it. Yeah, I don't have problems with it, but I, 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 it depends what you mean when you say economic phenomena of property or markets, I suppose it, it entails a lot of shit. Yeah, I guess if you're using a strict sort of historical definition of economic phenomena. Like Wright is no doubt doing, he is obeying the split between economics and ecology, for instance. Also, you know, the home economics is not part of that exactly. Yeah, it, it, it's like, okay, you can look at it like history is fundamentally about who gets what, what people get what. But then you have to ask, like, who are considered to be people, right? <laughs> like th th that is an important part of that equation <laughs> yeah it's the domain right like if the domain is part of the answer yeah well let's see what the chat has to say here let's have a look here girls 4xyz say find your love in new city heart thanks girls 4 yeah Please. dot xyz <laughs> <laughs> well i mean it's important to have Listen, you know, we can't discriminate Spot against bots. robots. Come on. We've all seen Measure of a Man. What, which one is Measure of a Man? Data trial. Data's on trial. Jay's humanity is on oh, trial. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yeah. The one have you seen the, the weird chaser. Yeah. <laughs> have, you, have you seen that one with Joaquin Phoenix where he falls in love with his, like, AI chatbot? Oh, That's God. her, right? Yeah. It's quite I good. I have not seen it. Did you see a cut? Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, yeah, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's, it, it was, it was pretty good. It was Spike crazy. Jones, yeah. right? That motherfucker writes the he, most depressing he, things I've ever seen in my life. I love him <laughs> as a director, but I, I, I don't want to know anything he thinks about. Like, I, if, if I yeah. ran North Korea, I would <laughs> kidnap Spike Jones and put a gun in his back and be like, <laughs> make me believe. Because his music videos for like the Beastie Boys and stuff are like amazing. That Apple ad he did. Woo. Oh, yeah. That shit was very life-affirming and fun. Yeah. Let, let's keep it not decadent, Spike, huh? 